Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's South Asia seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my, my good friend and colleague, Mitra Sharafi, from the UW Law School, who also has affiliation with our history department. Um, it's a uh, it's a particular pleasure for me because, in a certain way, Mitra kind of saved me here. Um, as many of you know, one of my good friends, uh, Charlie Hallisey, left a few years ago, and. Um, in the intellectual void left in terms of conversations, um, Mitra stepped in and uh, has become a very uh, wonderful conversation partner for me over the last several years. And so, so I'm happy to introduce her today, um, talking about the topic of her new book, I assume, um, which I'm eagerly uh, waiting to read. Um, Mitra has degrees both from um, uh, Princeton, where she took a PhD, and then uh, law degrees from Oxford and Cambridge and uh, so is uh, one of those unique um, amphibious uh, <laughs> individuals. Yeah, uh, She just recently finished an NSF grant, and, um, which is pretty difficult for people in the humanities to get, um, but uh, uh, she just worked on that and has now recently completed this manuscript about what you're going to hear in a moment, uh, which, the title of which is, I think, the same, Parsi Legal Culture in British India. Uh, she's also published in journals like the Law and History Review, the Indian Economic and Social History Review, and Law and Social Inquiry. Um, and uh, she has a, she's been a really driving force in the development of a kind of, 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 of a space in the, in the academy for South Asian legal studies as a unique field. And uh, to, to sort of bolster that, she's been uh, the, the leader, really, of the CRN, this, the Collaborative Research Network for the Law and Society Association, one of the big international organizations for legal studies, um, and locally has with, um, with me and uh, Sumadhu Atapaka um, run the South Asia uh, Legal Studies Working Group here on campus, which is, uh, we're about to say, growing and thriving. So uh, without further ado, I will um, introduce Professor Mitra Sharafi to speak on Parsi legal culture in British India. Thank you, Don, for that very nice introduction. Um, I've, um, I've brought many speakers through the Thursday lunch lecture series at the center, but this is the first time that I'm presenting my own research, so um, it's a real treat for me. Um, like Don said, I'm going to be speaking today, giving you an overview of my book project, Parsi Legal Culture in British India. Um, and the question you may have uh, right at the beginning is, you know, what is, what is so interesting about um, this ethno-religious minority, uh, the Parsis, um, and law. Why Parsis and law? So I'm convinced that there's a special uh, and very unusual relationship, I think, between Parsis and law. You see it today um, in India. I do most of my research at the Bombay High Court. And very often when I'm sitting and doing my research, I will see some Parsis that I know passing through. And I'll ask them, oh, what are you doing here? And they'll say, oh, well, you know, we're in the middle of a suit with the Parsi panchayat, uh, so we're just, you know, we're passing through. So um, even today when Parsis have an internal dispute within the community, often about something religiously sensitive, they often sue each other. So there's a very rapid, I think, turn to law and to litigation today. Um, amongst the Parsis of India. My argument is that that starts and that emerges as a result of the colonial experience. The Parsis um, in the colonial period mastered the mechanics and language of colonial law. And by that I mean state law, the law um, applied in the Bombay High Court, for instance. They went for law in the extreme. And they managed to uh, increase their collective autonomy and, in fact, de-anglicize the law that was applicable to them, uh, not by avoiding the state or avoiding law, but, in fact, by doing just the opposite. That is, by sinking right into the heart of the colonial legal system, um, in a sense, by taking over certain pockets of legal institutions. They worked within and through colonial law rather than against or from outside it. And so that is what makes them interesting to me. And I'm, I think that's what should make Parsi legal, interest, uh, legal history interesting to a lot of people who are not necessarily um, South Asianists even, but who are simply interested in the interaction between minorities and colonized peoples on the one hand, and state law on the other hand. Oh, and before I move on, I have to say that the gentleman in the center, um, aside from the wonderful mustaches in this picture, the gentleman in the center is P.B. Vacha, 
who was a uh, renowned Parsi lawyer in the colonial period. He led a couple of the really famous uh, divorce suits between Iranis, who are Zoroastrians who came to India in the 19th and 20th centuries as opposed to earlier. Um, and he was also a professor of Persian at Elphinstone College before he became a lawyer. So here he is sitting with two of his uh, associates. He also wrote a very famous history of the Bombay High Court in 1961. And his son was my first host in Bombay, also a lawyer trained in the colonial period. So here's the Bombay High Court, my main kind of archive. And this quotation um, really gets at what started me on this project. AJC Mystery was a Parsi managing clerk in a Bombay law firm um, that was started by Parsis called Wadi Gandhi and Co. And at two points in 1911 and 1925, he ends up wanting to do something a little bit special for the senior partners of the firm because they're celebrating an anniversary of the firm. And so both times he writes memoirs of the firm, what happens on a daily basis, who everyone is, not just the senior partners, but also the, um, the guards and the typists and the shorthand clerks. Um, and he gives us lists also of all of the lawyers in Bombay. Um, and from those lists, I've been able to identify which communities people are coming from. And so I've been able to generate some statistics, which I think say a lot about this Parsi uh, legal history phenomenon. So in the early 20th century, approximately 6% of the population of Bombay City was Parsi. But according to Mystery's lists, between a third and almost a half of all the lawyers in Bombay at that time were Parsi, and that's including Europeans. About 11% of all the high court judges were themselves Parsi in Bombay in this period. And I've gone through the reported case law that is the Indian Law Reports Bombay series. And I find that almost a fifth of all the cases in those law reports from 1900 to 1930 involved at least um, one Parsi party. Approximately 5% of all the reported case law are suits between Parsis. So the population of Parsis is 6%, but they are um, grossly uh, uh, um, represented at a disproportionate rate when it comes to the legal profession and also litigation in the courts. And I think that Mystery's quotation really sums this up. So he says, the Parsis are the life and soul of litigation in Bombay, and in one shape or the other, they're connected with the majority of the suits in the high court. The first thing that started me on this project was noticing that there were so many cases in the law reports between Parsi parties. I was, I was confused and I was surprised because I would have expected that people coming from the same community in South Asia would have had internal community ways of settling disputes with each other. So they would have had their own religious authorities that could settle disputes, or their own community authorities, their own Parsi panchayat to settle disputes. So my question was, what is going on here? Why are they coming into the state courts? Why are they coming to an outside forum when they want to settle an inside dispute? And a lot of these disputes were about very sensitive religious matters as well. Taking one step back, I then started noticing that a lot of the lawyers involved in these cases <coughs> between Parsis were themselves Parsi. And then occasionally, the judges would also be Parsi. So I've got examples of cases where there are Parsi litigants on both sides, Parsi lawyers before a Parsi judge, and the whole thing is in the Bombay High Court. So this is very um, uh, important moment for me because I suddenly realized maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Maybe this is not an outside forum at all. Maybe the Parsis feel that they have so kind of infiltrated, you could say, this part of the um, state legal institution that in fact they're very comfortable because they have their own people taking care of these matters. Taking one more step back, I then started asking, well, does the Parsi relationship with law extend beyond uh, litigation on the courts? Does it extend to legislation? And what I found was a very interesting and, in fact, earlier history than when all the litigation starts going. What I found was that from 18, the 1830s onward, the Parsis developed uh, very effective and impressive uh, lobbying groups that would collect, um, uh, collect feedback from within the community, not just in India, but uh, around the world, that would draft legislation. Um, and then that would push to get it passed. And by the end of the colonial period, like in the 1930s, there were quite a few Parsi legislators. Um, and so you'd have these select committees that were you know, half or even majority Parsi um, steering through legislation that was drafted and lobbied for 
by the Parsis as well. So you have this very effective, almost vertically integrated kind of system of lobbying and legislating as well. So the portrait that I create in the book is divided into the litigation half, where I look at the courts and the legal profession, and then the legislation half, where I look at this whole lobbying tradition. And what I find is that um, uh, the pattern really is unusual. So there were other similarly positioned, affluent, anglicized trading minorities in Bombay at the same time, and they did not do this. They did not have the same kind of case law between their members, and they also did not have the kind of um, lobbying and legislating mechanism that the Parsis developed. So I'm thinking about uh, the Jews in Bombay, the Armenians, the Bori Muslims, um, arguably the Jains, although Don might want to take that up in the question period. In any case, I'm convinced that the Parsis exhibit a, a, a kind of a love of, of common law legalism and an adoption of the colonizer's um, uh, legal system in a way that no other uh, similarly placed trading minority in Bombay does in the period. So let me start by giving a bit of an overview about Zoroastrianism and Parsi history in general. So the religion of Zoroastrianism uh, originates in ancient Persia. Its, its prophet is Zarathustra, uh, also known as Zoroaster. His dates are around 1200, 1300 BC. So this religion dates from about the same time as Judaism. Um, Parsis, so Parsi is the ethnic label for this community and Zoroastrian is the religious label for the community. Uh, Parsis, Zoroastrians I should say, tend to present their religion as a monotheistic religion. Um, I'm convinced that it's much more of a dualist religion. And the story is that while Zoroastrians were living under Muslim rule in Persia, later Iran, and under Christian rule in colonial India, there were many kind of political reasons why it was in their favor to um, massage their religion and present it as a monotheistic religion. But in fact, like I say, I think it's um, better understood as a dualist religion. The story is uh, one of, a, of an eternal cosmic struggle between um, the deity of good, Ahura Mazda, and the deity of evil, Ahriman. There's an elaborate set of purity laws, uh, elaborate demonology, the death rites you may be familiar with, the death rites are quite famous. So when Zoroastrians die, um, their bodies are, in India, are left on the top of these uh, um, towers of silence. Um, vultures then come and eat the flesh, and the bones are then dropped into a central cavity of this tower of silence. Um, so, so the Parsis are famous for that. Zoroastrianism in the ancient Persian period did have such a thing as law. I mean, it's a little hard to separate the law and the religion because essentially Zoroastrianism was the religion of the royal court of ancient Persia, which also developed its own law. So, um, but there certainly was an elaborate body of law in ancient Zoroastrian Persia. By the time the Zoroastrians come to India and by the time the British arrive, uh, it seems that most of that legal knowledge has been lost. And this is one reason why the British make a promise to Hindus and Muslims that uh, religious law will be applied to them in areas of marriage and inheritance. So if you're Muslim, you'll get Islamic law as applied by the colonial courts. If you're Hindu, you'll get Hindu law as applied by the colonial courts. But everyone else got English law. And the Parsis were part of that, everyone else. Um, and I argue that it was because English law was, uh, was, was handed out to the Parsis in that early colonial period, it's because of that that they really um, got organized in response. And so that's the beginning of this whole uh, legal mechanism within the Parsi community. The legal mobil mobilization was a response to the trigger of having English law applied to their uh, marriage and inheritance cases especially. So I always show this, this um, slide to audiences that may not be South Asianists, so probably a lot of you don't need this, but I just I like to uh, remind people that, that they probably do know of many um, famous Parsis today. So we've got Zubin Mehta, the orchestra conductor at the left. Um, we've got the two Homi Babas. So Homi Baba to the left is the famous nuclear physicist who founded the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. Um, the Homi Baba next to him is the famous post-colonial theorist. Um, Rohinton Mystery, wonderful Parsi novelist living in Toronto, is at the bottom. And Homai Viaravala, who is India's first uh, photographer, 
is at the right hand side. And then Godrej and Tata are huge corporate entities that were founded by Parsis. And of course, there's also Freddie Mercury. <laughs> His name at birth was Farouk Bulsara. In fact, he was Parsi and grew up in Zanzibar, off the coast of East Africa. <coughs> so a nice little example of, um, of this, the Parsi diaspora and history of mobilization and movement. So um, Persia was conquered by uh, Arab Muslims in the seventh century. And over the next couple of centuries, the majority of Persians eventually become Muslim. That's about the same period when a small group of followers of Zoroastrianism, the pre-existing religion, come migrate from Persia to India. And they come to the section that I have put in uh, the white circle, which is kind of South Gujarat. They migrate to Bombay when the British arrive and start turning Bombay into a big uh, commercial capital. But that's not the end of the story, of course. There's a lot more movement. The Parsis are one of the great um, trading, mercantile, uh, minority diasporas of the world. So, uh, so there's a certain amount of movement. I'll do the internal stuff first. There, there's a large and old Parsi community in what, uh, Karachi, what is today Pakistan. Uh, a lot of Parsis end up in Hyderabad, living in the independent princely state under the Nizam of Hyderabad. Even in this territory here, there are a whole bunch of little teeny weeny um, princely states. Examples like Baroda uh, come to mind. And the Parsis were, had large populations in those little independent states and were often quite high up in government in those states as well. Uh, there were Parsis who moved to Ceylon, today Sri Lanka. Um, there were Parsis who moved to Aden and East Africa. Famous Adenwala family uh, is known for kind of building up a lot of the railroads in East Africa. Then there was also movement in the eastward direction. Singapore and Hong Kong have very old Parsi communities. I wrote my dissertation on the Parsi community of Rangoon, which had a really big piece of litigation that I'll tell you about shortly. Uh, a lot of Parsis in Calcutta also. Um, and then China, and China is a really big and important one because the Parsis under British rule rise to affluence and become a very successful, very wealthy trading minority, essentially middlemen, commercial middlemen between British traders and Indian traders. But the thing where they really make a lot of wealth is in the opium trade. So they shipped, they were the main shippers, the Wadia family of oops, Bombay was the, were the main shippers shipping opium from Western India to China. And even today, if you look at um, Parsi women's formal dress, the kind of particular kind of saris that they wear at formal occasions, um, they're called gadas, and they are made on Chinese silk with Chinese embroidery, Chinese motifs. And the story is that when the Parsi opium shippers were in China, they taught Chinese weavers how to make fabric in exactly the way that you could then wear as a sari. So still today, you can see this kind of little hint of that Chinese, um, Chinese heritage. A lot of the money that was made in the opium trade was then reinvested in the later 19th century onwards in the industrialization of India. And so J.N. Tata is, if there's one person who's going to take credit for sort of the industrialization of India, it's usually, uh, it's usually he. And he starts the Tata Company also, which continues today to be a huge commercial um, uh, enterprise in India. I like to frame this project in a, uh, a bit of a comparative context, because I think you can look at a lot of stories of minorities and of colonized people and their interaction with law, and you'll see a lot of, um, a lot of sad histories, right? You'll see a lot of stories about avoidance, failure, and loss. So on the spectrum of religious minorities who have avoided state law or have jumped in readily like the Parsis, I always like to point to the Anabaptists um, as an example of a religious minority that avoided state law historically. So the Anabaptists and uh, it's kind of an umbrella term for a number of Protestant denominations including the Mennonites, the Hutterites, they migrate, they end up fleeing Central and Eastern Europe and coming to the Canadian prairies in the early 20th century. Um, and they are interesting to me because they are extremely law avoiding. So uh, the Hutterites, the Mennonites, avoid interaction with the state. And here I'm drawing upon the work of Alvin Esau, who argues that, first of all, very strict kind of rules against taking each other to court. That is one thing that you simply would not do. Um, 
And then secondly, because of this notion of the separation of the two kingdoms, that is the kingdom of God, which is for the saved, i.e. the people in these communities, and the, the world of the fallen, which is represented by the state and the general public, because Anabaptists believed in a clean separation between those two, the idea was that you, as, a, as an Anabaptist, would avoid interacting with the state, if at all possible. And so um, Alvin Esau has looked at the way that Anabaptists who decided to become lawyers in the early 20th century essentially had to leave their communities. Um, so that's an example of a, of, a, of a religious minority that avoided the state in the extreme. So nice contrast with the Parsis. There are also examples of other colonized peoples who uh, adopted the colonized system of law and legal thinking, but who lost out of that interaction. And the classic case, I think, are the Cherokee. Um, the Cherokee in the 19th century adopt um, the language and mechani mechanisms of uh, American common law courts. And all through the 19th century, there was a system of Cherokee courts which pretty much looked like American common law courts. They were just run in Cherokee. They had law reports, um, lawyers and judges who were all Cherokee themselves. The most famous incident though, and that system gets shut down at the end of the 19th century. Uh, the most famous incident that I'm, that I'm referring to though is uh, the very famous US Supreme Court cases in which the Cherokee went to court to try to prevent uh, removal, that is to try to prevent themselves from being forced to leave Georgia and moved to what is today Oklahoma. They win those cases, but the tragedy is um, that Andrew Jackson, the president, says that he simply doesn't care what the US Supreme Court says. And so the upshot is that um, not long after, uh, you have this forced removal of Cherokees all across the country, um, and the Trail of Tears is a reference to that forced population transfer. So that's an example of a colonized population that tried to take on the colonizers' lawways, but didn't really help them in the end. There are also scholars who argue that when minorities or colonized people take on the colonizer's law ways, they lose something of themselves. <coughs> Gerald Auerbach has written a book where he makes this argument about American Jews. He says that yes, they kind of learned and took on and mastered uh, American law, but they really lost a lot of cultural and religious integrity and autonomy as a result. Mary Matsuda has made the same argument about um, indigenous Hawaiians. Um, so I'm making an opposite argument. I'm arguing that uh, this counter case study of the Parsis show that it's possible to actually use the colonizer's legal system and gain in autonomy, gain in control. As I see it, there are four classic minority strategies for gaining control over the law that affects you as a minority. Um, the first two are exit strategies and are really quite radical. So one thing that minorities have done is they have moved to a place where they will become the majority. So I'm thinking about Jewish migration to Israel, Mormon migration to Utah, Muslim migration to Pakistan and Bangladesh. You move to a place where you are the majority and then you control the state and you control the law. That's one approach. Another approach is separatism. You don't move, but you force the state that is controlling you to leave, and you create your own state. The Parsis have done um, the opposite, and I've got this word infiltration up on the screen. I'm not really happy with it. It sounds a bit too conspiratorial, so if you have any other ideas, I'd love to hear them. But, but really, what they did was they stayed, um, and instead they sank into uh, legal institutions. And they did this in two ways, like I've already mentioned. At the legislative level, there's the whole lobbying and drafting of legislation that went on. At the litigation level, there is um, the idea that you um, have enough of your people in the legal profession that you eventually come to even control litigation between your members. And I like this picture. This is a photo of Jamshidji Kanga, who is a famous Parsi barrister right at the end of the colonial period and into the independence period. Um, and I love this picture because it kind of sums up, I think, what the Parsis managed to do. He was born into a priestly family. Priestly status is essentially hereditary uh, in Zoroastrianism. And so he's here. He would always wear his priestly turban. But he's also combined it with his barrister's gowns and bands. So it's kind of an argument that I'm making about assimilation. Um, and in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm adding on to Homi Baba's own point. I mean, Homi Baba argues that um, uh, even with assimilated elites, 
there is such a thing as kind of mimicry and that you have a you have a, a psychological edge over the colonizer because you are mimicking the colonizer so very well that the colonizer is deeply disturbed by it. Um, but what I'm arguing is it's not just a psychological edge that the Parsis got out of adopting the English language, um, colonial law, colonial dress. It's not just a psychological edge, it's also very particular legal institutions. So the Parsis create their own body of personal law through legislation. Out of that legislation, they create a special matrimonial <coughs> court which I'll tell you about shortly. It operates with a matrimonial jury of Parsis. No other community got that. Um, they also, like I said, uh, created a, a large enough presence in the legal profession that they could come to control many cases between their members. So first of all, legislation. And here um, I've, got a, I've got a list of the very particular acts that were essentially drafted, lobbied for, and um, passed through uh, Parsi collective effort. Um, in the beginning, what the Parsis did, was they, tr they tried to lobby for exemption from general law that applied to everyone. And this is a very common pattern. A lot of minorities have done this. Quakers in Britain, the Amish in the US, Sikhs in Canada, um, Jewish marriage has some very interesting exemptions in Rhode Island. Um, this is a common pattern that minorities will, will, will lobby and just get a small exemption packed into a larger piece of legislation where it says that they are exempt from this, this um, particular act. That's the first thing that the Parsis do. This 1837 act was, um, was uh, a way of reversing primogenitor. So as I mentioned before, in the early colonial period, it's English law that is applied to the Parsis because the British think that the Parsis have no religious law. Um, primogenitor is the rule in English inheritance law that the eldest son inherits all of the real estate. This was being applied to the Parsis, um, and they reacted against it. And they get this very short, very small act passed, which says that primogenitor does not apply to them. The other acts, though, are something a lot bigger. And this can only work in a personal law system. Personal law system, of course, is where you have the religious law of each community applied to its own matrimonial and inheritance cases. So these bottom four acts represent two big waves of lobbying um, activity, 1855 to 1865, and then about 1925 to 1940. And what happens here is that the Parsis actually pass acts that create Parsi personal law. So these acts lay out the substantive content of inheritance and marriage law that will be applied to the Parsis from then on. So this is very different from the other big religious communities in India. Hindus and Muslims have British judges in the beginning applying their understanding of Hindu and Islamic law in the courts. They never um, pass legislation themselves which proposes and establishes the rules. Litigation, you see a lot of lawsuits between Parsis and in, uh, inheritance, huge number of cases, but the ones I want to focus on, the areas I want to focus on are marriage and religion. So the um, 1865 Par Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act creates a special system of matrimonial courts for people who are married under the Parsi matrimonial regime. And this system is unique because it creates what is essentially a jury of co-religionists. So that jury decides whether Parsis will get a divorce or not. This is very, very interesting because no other community in colonial India had a jury deciding its matrimonial cases, and that includes Europeans. There's no other place in civil law in colonial India where you see a jury. So the Parsis managed to propose this thing, get it passed, and, um, and happily be operating with a system that is completely out of the question for everyone else. I also make an argument that um, the Parsi jury, while well, they were uh, appointed, they tended to be very elite um, <coughs> senior men from the community. Most of the litigants coming to them, most of the plaintiffs <coughs> in this court were women and often poor women. And most of those cases were, most of those divorces were granted. So the mechanism seems to be one of senior males disciplining, senior elite males disciplining non-elite males. I'm reading this as these elite Parsi jurors um, slamming uh, more working class husbands and kind of disciplining them. So it's really a, 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 it's really a phenomenon of the empowerment of senior male elites 
Amongst Hindus, Muslims, and every other community, you'd have a judge deciding matrimonial cases. So I think this is really a story <coughs> about the disempowerment of senior male elites in other communities and the empowerment of Parsi male elites. Religion, um, who is a Parsi? And this is kind of flowing from my dissertation work. I wrote my dissertation on the second case listed here. There are a couple of really big cases that came before the courts that were cases over whether uh, ethnic outsiders could be accepted into the Zoroastrian religion um, and whether they could be entitled to benefit from Parsi trusts. So these are framed as lawsuits about trusts. Um, all of the Parsi fire temples, towers of silence, and vast charitable trust funds um, all fell under the law of trusts. So in the first case, a French woman had married one of the men in the Tata family. And right before she got married, she um, tried to be initiated into the religion. And then they got married with a Zoroastrian marriage ceremony. And so the question was whether all of that was valid, whether the trustees had to allow her to benefit from the properties and funds, whether she could be allowed into a fire temple at all. You're not allowed to go into a fire temple unless you are um, uh, Zoroastrian. The court in that case, very interesting because the judge was the first Parsi judge of the Bombay High Court, and he happened to be very orthodox religiously. The orthodox on this question opposed allowing ethnic outsiders in. So he delivers a judgment where he says no, essentially. Um, 1925, you get, in a way, a sequel to that case. Uh, this little girl, this is the only image we have of her, um, was allegedly uh, an Indian orphan. She was adopted by a Parsi couple living in Rangoon in British Burma. They initiate her into the religion, or try to, when she's 14. And then her adoptive father wants to bring her into the Rangoon fire temple. And again, the question is, do the trustees have to let her in or not? <coughs> This case goes all the way to the top. It goes all the way to London, to the Privy Council, which is the highest court of appeal for the British Empire. And the judges who are British rely upon the, the, the Pettit versus Jijibai case and judgment. And they really do kind of defer to that earlier Parsi judge who took uh, uh, an exclusive stance on this question of uh, admission of outsiders. So I don't mean to tell too triumphalist a story with all of this. I realize that my overall story is a very kind of positive and celebratory one about how a minority can get it together legally and get lots done. There was a, a cost, of course, and that is um, that there's a lot of infighting in these lawsuits in particular. And this judge was the second judge on the bench in the case of the French Mrs. Tata. He was a, a blind British judge. He was junior in rank to the Parsi judge who decided the case, so he just ends up writing a kind of meek, concurring uh, judgment. But he ends up making a statement at one point that too much dirty linen has been uh, washed in public in the Parsi um, conversion case. And certainly you can, you can make that argument. The case law between Parsis is full of all kinds of allegations about addiction, um, imbecility, adultery, venereal disease. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I've just got two examples to give you. The first one is a fascinating case, um, actually in a New York court in 1871. This is a case of a Parsi, mm -hmm. uh, a wealthy Parsi man who had just won a big inheritance suit against his brothers in Bombay. He takes his hundred thousand dollars in gold and he goes on a trip, a mad trip around the world, and he ends up in New York and he's kind of lost it by that point. He is. Um, institutionalized, people believe that he has gone insane. And the question is what to do with him and what to do with all of his gold. Um, at one point, his father-in-law comes from Bombay to take him home. And he is blocked because the brothers who lost in the inheritance suit have communicated with the British consul in New York and tell the British consul not to allow the father-in-law to take Kola home. As a result, Kola gets escorted home by an American uh, army major a couple of years later. The army major. Uh, along with a clerk of the New York court, take all his money, and 20, 30 years later, the New York Times is full of stories of when this is finally discovered. So the story for me there is that if there hadn't been so much infighting within the family, this man would have happily been taken home with all his gold, um, and none of this, none of this um, ever would have happened. In the second case, so that's a story about a family that gets ripped apart by litigation. The second case is another one of these big Privy Council cases. goes all the way to London, all the way to the top. This was a case amongst the Parsis of Secundrabad, 
which was a British cantonment, military cantonment in Hyderabad, the independent state in central India. And in this case, this was a case about whether one side could build a new tower of silence pretty close to the old one. And in this case, every single adult male Parsi in that community was either uh, on one side or the other of the lawsuit. So simply the name of the case goes on for about five pages when you look at the records. Another example of how uh, a community was absolutely <coughs> ripped apart by all of this litigation. However, as much as you had this destructive micro-mechanism, you also have what I'm arguing was a very productive and efficient macro-mechanism. You have this magic formula of both intra-group, heavy intra-group litigation and a large presence in the legal profession. This is the judge who decided the case against the French Mrs. Tata. His name was Dinsha Davar. 1906, he gets appointed to the Bombay High Court. And for the next 10 years, um, most, of the, most of the big important cases between Parsis end up coming to him. And he decides them in a religiously orthodox fashion. Just quickly, this first case was an 1887 case before <coughs> Davar was on the bench in which a British judge um, invalidated a form of trust that was used to fund death commemoration ceremonies amongst the Parsis. As a result of that 1887 case, about 15 other cases were decided in the same way. So 15 other death commemoration trusts were invalidated. Davar, a year after he gets onto the bench, gets a 16th of these cases, and he manages to reverse it. So nice little example of how he's kind of de-anglicizing, correcting, reversing the um, rather ignorant take on his own religion by that earlier British judge. There were lawyers, there were judges. Um, this is a photo I took in London at Lincoln's Inn, which is one of the inns of court where barristers are trained. Uh, Dinshar Fardunji Mullah was a solicitor, then later a judge, and then later a, a, a writer of treatises, copious, copious writer of legal treatises covering many areas of Indian law. He goes on to become the first Parsi judge of the Privy Council. So this is the highest court of appeal for the entire empire, um, and he is there. Uh, you also have the world of law publishing, not just the people publishing the books, but the people reporting on the cases, the people writing and publishing the law review articles. You have even the people who bound the judge's notebooks at the Bombay High Court. I see these little stickers. It's a Parsi name. Um, so even the book binders to the high court are a Parsi company. And you have legal support staff. So here are two of the senior partners of Wadia Gandhi and Co. I mentioned that Mystery was the clerk who wrote the memoirs um, of, these, of, these, of this law firm. So the picture is kind of all the way down and all the way across. You have Parsis in the legal profession of Bombay, really dominating. The most interesting figures, perhaps, are the earliest ones. And it all starts with Parsis who are low down court officials under the East India Company. I've noticed that people like Nauroji Ferdunji were clerks in the, in the court, and they go on to lead the whole lobbying and legislative effort of 1855, 1865. So this is, this is, a, this is one of the um, submissions that he makes um, when he's pushing to get that legislation passed. You also have the sons of those court officials being some of the first to go to London to study at the Inns of Court and become barristers. Those barristers come back, and it is they who eventually become the first judges. So Dinsha Davar followed exactly that model. So I really think it all starts with these relatively low-ranking uh, court officials under the East India Company. How it ends, well, I'm just going to give you the end of the story um, at the end of the colonial period. And here I'm making an argument that Parsi legalism affected not only the Parsi community itself, it also had an effect on law um, and politics in India generally. So I've got pictures here of three of the leaders of the Indian nationalists, the independence movement, in its kind of early phase from 1895 to 1915. You had um, moderates, they were known as constitutionalists, and they were all Parsi. So Dadabai Nairoji, Feroz Mehta, Dinsha Vacha. Only Feroz Mehta is the lawyer of the three, but I'm convinced that Parsi legal culture kind of seeped um, seeped into the community enough that simply being Parsi and coming, uh, and coming to the question of law and state institutions, it's not at all surprising that you would take, um, you would take a, a, a law-centered approach. So 
In that early phase of the Indian independence movement, constitutionalists argued for political agitation. And their picture was that you have a duty to fight for change, um, fight for greater autonomy, even independence of India, but you should do it within legal institutions and using legal mechanisms. They were later defeated both by the kind of extremist revolutionaries who wanted to use violence and by just the opposite, right? The Gandhians who wanted to use pacifism. Both the extremists and the Gandhians argue that it's no use working through law and through state legislation and, and, and state institutions. You have to step outside of it um, and, and work through extra legal resistance. So this early phase, um, it ends up losing out by about 1920. But I argue that it comes back. It doesn't die, it just goes to sleep. It comes back from 1947 on when India returns to a constitutionalist tradition, right? India becomes an independent country, has its own constitution between 1947 and 1950. You see that being drafted. Um, and then there is a need to turn back to legal methods and legal institutions and legal ways of bringing about change. So I argue that Parsi legal culture kind of contributes to Indian legal culture and constitutionalism um, because of its dedication to the notion of the rule of law. And this is a page from the Hyderabad uh, Towers of Silence case at the Privy Council. So that wraps it up for me. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Yes. Ma'am. Sure. So, I mean, of course, I think some of this is a reward to the Parsis for being, in general, very loyal to British rule. Of course, there's that. And when I go through sort of the records of the British Library India office, um, it's actually very hard to find material on all of this because I think the British were just not concerned about what was happening in the Parsi community in general, right? They didn't see the Parsis as any kind of a political threat, not at all. So I think some of it was definitely a reward. Um, for being loyal to British rule. Mark. Oh, There's fascinating stuff. And, uh, I just want to go back. You said there were four minority strategies, that, uh, but I missed the third and fourth. OK, so I lumped them together. So there are the exit and the infiltration kind of strategies. Mm -hmm. Exit strategies are migration to a place where you can become the majority, and separatism. Um, infiltration are, I suppose, um, mastering and getting into the legislative Mm. mechanics and doing the same with the courts. So litigation and legislation. Well, I, I wanted to sort of relate your story to another distinction. If you talk about personal law systems, there's basically two kinds. You can say to, people, to a minority group, we'll administer, we the government will administer your law in our courts, which is basically what the British system was, uh, or the alternative is the system which we give the name that it had in the Ottoman Empire, the millet system, where a millet or community, each minority in the, in the Ottoman Empire, it was the, uh, uh, the Jews, the, the Armenians, uh, all these various groups uh, were allowed <coughs> to basically do family and inter-community law for themselves, each millet. And there was some kind of appeal, uh, I think in some cases, to Ottoman authorities. But basically, it was, say, community control, uh, as opposed to using their law in the government courts. And it's curious in your story that, to some extent, the Parsi case, uh, while India generally is a personal law system, uh, not a millet system, uh, the Parsis are almost a de facto millet, in which the, it, it, but partly maybe because they're, they're heavily concentrated in one area and the British are very friendly to them and basically but it seems to me a lot of the story you tell is really 
almost the millet story rather than the personal law story. Yeah, especially, I've, I've had that thought as well, especially with the Parsi Chief Matrimonial Court, mm -hmm. which has got its jury. Um, it was technically overseen by a Bombay High Court judge, but as soon as there was any Parsi judge of the Bombay High Court, mm -hmm. that person would be given the job. Mm -hmm. So you, again, you have this little bubble of complete community autonomy within the state system. It's also interesting that, I mean, it's because the British have that state-involved model of personal law that the Parsis are forced to kind of react mm -hmm and become good at state law, right? So that is the trigger, that is the stimulus, I think, that gets them to organize legally. So it's kind of interesting that that can actually, that they actually turn it around and, and use it to their benefit. Yeah, no, it's, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating case. <coughs> Pitcher, I'm curious about the map you have of all the migration. Do you have any, are there any similar stories about how well the Parsis infiltrated those legal systems as well? There are certainly famous Parsi law firms and lawyers in Ceylon, Hong Kong, Sri Lanka, East Africa, um, Zanzibar included. And, um, and, and I, I argue actually that, that, that the Parsi lawyer is almost a kind of stereotypical figure in the empire. I have this wonderful case of this young Parsi man in London who gets put on trial for fraud in London and what he'd done was he'd gone around to a bunch of London solicitors firms and he pretended that he was the son of, a, of an important Parsi lawyer um, and he asked to borrow money and promised that his father would pay it back immediately and he was just waiting for the boat to come and he'd be going back to India and, and it kept working and working and working uh, I think because those British lawyers knew that oh Parsi lawyers of course you know everyone knows so even if they didn't recognize the name of this particular Parsi lawyer they did have a sense that that's a plausible story Right? So I think there's certainly, yes, there is certainly that kind of tradition in the Indian Ocean, British Imperial and, and, and British context. There's also a wonderful thing that a friend of mine who, who works on um, Mandate Palestine and, and Iraq found in the archives. He found a little project where the British were um, trying to teach the Iraqis <laughs> um, how to run a legal system um, uh, under Mandate Iraq. And they brought in Parsi lawyers to do that. So it's very interesting that they're kind of the empire's, the empire's lawyers in a way. Yeah. Is that the, um, oh, sorry. No. oh, sorry. Is that the international um, uh, network of lobbyists that you referred to that uh, in that that like work together to make le legislation? Yeah. The the lobbyists I see more just in India. They're based in India. They certainly collect feedback mm -hmm. on legislation from Parsis from China to Persia to England. But the people running that kind of effort are in India most of the time. Um, you expressed a little bit of reservation about maybe kind of coming up with a sort of triumphalist <laughs> narrative yeah. about Parsis. I wonder if maybe you can sort of complicate which particular interests within the Parsi community are benefiting from this particularly. It seems certainly that um, upper class commercial families are certainly yeah. doing well in this. It seems to be re reinforcing aspects of patriarchy. Um, and then I also wonder if, uh, you know, who, which other communities are sort of losing out to the Parsis in their domination of the legal community? How is that affecting interest in Bombay, commercial uh, competition, that sort of thing? Yeah, so the first interesting thing is about, about this commercial issue. I came to the project assuming that when you're dealing with a big trading community, perhaps every family, every trading family kind of thought, well, it's good if we have one lawyer who can help us with all of our business <coughs> needs. And I came expecting to find that pattern. And I really didn't find it. What I kept noticing was that commercial suits between Parsis settle, usually before they get to judgment. And the really big bad cases that are coming all the way to court and judgment and getting appealed all the way up to London are the cases with a binary outcome, not an incremental one. So when you're suing in most commercial suits, usually you're suing for an amount of money. And it seems to me that it's easier to settle, it's easier to compromise and find a, a happy sum that everyone can agree to on that. Um, but it's the, you know, the religious trust suits are binary, right? You get an injunction or you don't. Um, one person can build the tower or they can't. And so I think, interestingly, it's kind of the religious suits that go further than the commercial suits. Um, so I didn't, I didn't find a lot of commercial litigation, uh, contrary to what I was expecting. Um, I think that you, you might also expect that the faction within the Parsis who were benefiting from all of this would be the ultra-anglicized, um, religiously liberal ones, 
right? I, I would have come to this expecting that if anyone is going to want the community to keep their disputes out of the courts, maintain a little bit of distance, it would be the religiously orthodox. That's what I expected. Again, that's not what I found. I found people like um, Davar, who's super religiously orthodox, and he's the one who wrote all of the leading judgments on Parsi trust cases. Um, there's also a couple really famous, really conservative orthodox lawyers, Parsi lawyers. One man called Vima Dalal is a huge eugenicist. Um, <laughs> And uh, again, so there's a kind of there's, there's some there's some unexpected patterns, I guess I would say. Do they have particular class interests within the Parsi community, or are there other sectarian issues? Or? Well, I mean, certainly when you're looking at, and my study is almost completely looking at civil law. There's not, there is criminal, there are criminal cases between the Parsis, but they're so low level that we don't have their records. Um, so certainly when you're dealing with inheritance suits, you're usually dealing with the affluent. Um, Anything coming, uh, property, most big property suits, again, are, are dealing with the affluent. The marriage court surprised me because it was majority working class. Uh, so that surprised me. But certainly I'd say the bulk of civil litigation is involving wealthy Parsis, yes. Finally, just one little comment to go back to your point about commercial interests and commercial families. Um, my working theory is that going into the legal profession was a more available uh, route for the upwardly mobile than business. It seems to me that if you came, if you're born into a big business family, then you could really go into business. But um, if you weren't, it would probably be easier for you to do well going into law than going into business. And Rakesh, uh, I would love to hear your I'd love to hear your views on that. But it seems to me that um, a number of the, the really big names like Din Shah Mullah, who I showed you, who was the Privy Council judge, he came from actually a very quite a poor background. So it seems like law allowed um, the self-made man a little bit more than business. Did you find any documentation of uh, some kind of a protest? Um, so the, the, the description seems to be of a very coherent cohesive strategy kind of followed. Um, they, were there parts of the Parsi community who were saying that this is not the way to go? Um, we need to sort of either take the Hindu Muslim perspective or some other perspective. Are there, is there any documentation of that kind? Because it seems to be a uh, too neat a story. Um, right. It's quite fascinating, but it's, I mean, having seen data and all kinds of other things, uh, I find it too uh, a set take, if you like. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, I'm not going to argue that the Parsi community was, was cohesive. I mean, there are huge um, fights raging about this conversion issue, proper appropriate death rights. Um, but those end up taking the form of litigation. And I think that what's going on there, it's not that everyone kind of agrees this is the right and the appropriate manner of settling the disputes. It's simply that if one side feels it is, then the other side is going to get dragged into court. So I think this is a common thing that legal historians of empire have noticed, which is when you set up and, and offer um, the colonial courts as an option, <coughs> even people that in principle might disagree with taking inside disputes out, even those people might occasionally be the ones leading the litigation because they think in this dispute they might win if they go to the state court. So it's kind of this, um, this uh, tempted this natural t temptation, I suppose, to, um, to sue in, in the state courts if you think it will help your short-term interests, even if you realize your long-term collective interests might be compromised by it. As for kind of resistance, I don't find a lot of direct comments about the whole Parsi legal phenomenon. I wish I found more of those. I think that it was kind of gradual, incremental, and so a lot of people didn't comment on it explicitly. There were some attempts to create an arbitration system um, in the early 20th century, an arbitration system where Parsi cases would go instead of going to the courts. And those were actually led by Parsi lawyers, but they end up failing. In the 1930s, there are about three or four arbitration bodies that do get set up, and they seem to work all right, but um, it's just the last 10 years of, of colonial rule. So I, I, don't, I don't see or find a huge amount of resistance. I agree with you that it does seem a little bit too clean. <laughs> Then it, was there no resistance from other minority groups? You were one right. of, and then I'm curious, so then did other minority groups try and take the Parsis as a model for right. 
legislating on their behalf. Right, right. Sorry, that was Rakesh's second question. So, um, certainly when I was doing the, ch I have a chapter on the jury system in the matrimonial court, and I kept wondering what the other communities must have said about this, because it is so clearly unfair in a sense. Um, the Parsi jury was not called a jury, it was called a system of a panel of delegates. So I think they kind of masked it a little bit with the language. I haven't been able to find any other communities commenting on that. But I certainly have seen, um, I have seen in a sense, mimicry of the lobbying and legislating pattern. So in the early 20th century, um, there are two big waves of Muslim legislation, legislation in Muslim personal law. And Muhammad Ali Jinnah is one of the leaders of that. Um, and in the first instance, what they're doing is correcting some of the mistakes that have been applied to Islamic waqfs. The British have thought, well, these are just like trusts, and they've sort of distorted the rules of waqf uh, law. So, so there's this Muslim campaign that drafts legislation and reverses all of that case law. And then in the 1930s, there's a, there's a big act about um, Muslim divorce. And again, that is uh, an effort from within the Muslim community. So I never see them explicitly saying we are imitating the Parsis, but I do see that, that, that in fact that's what they are doing just um, decades and decades later. With Hindu personal law, the big movement of, of reform and legislation of course happens with the Hindu code bill, so in early, the early independence period is when that happens. I would love to find more statements from other, other communities, but I just Some haven't those kind of... Do communities use Parsi lawyers to help advocate on their behalf? Right. There, do they talk to each other? Or? Right. So, there, so, so in general, um, so I, I have followed this, this question of um, community loyalty and hiring a lawyer, right? And to what extent you hire someone from your community. And what I find is that um, in general, most Parsi litigants hired Parsi lawyers a lot of the time. Uh, and you see that also amongst other communities. But at the very top, the very best lawyers, nobody seems to care what their communities are. Mm -hmm. So um, you have all kinds of people hiring across communities. That's very common.